one you should be looking at. And the reason I provide you that, that information about ANU is because um, really it's our great privilege today to have as our speaker Professor Brian Schmidt, who is the Vice Chancellor of ANU at the Australian National University. Um, and in reading Professor, Professor Schmidt's bio, um, I do profess that I perhaps should have studied harder at school. Um, and I'll, I'll let you know why. Uh, <laughs> Professor Smith is the winner of the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics, an award he shared with Sol Perlmutter and Adam Rees uh, for their 1998 discovery that the universe is expanding at an ever-increasing rate. Um, Professor, Professor Schmidt also shared the 2006 Shaw Prize in Astronomy with his colleagues that I've mentioned before. And before becoming Vice Chancellor of the ANU, um, Professor Schmidt was a distinguished professor, Australian Research Council laureate, an astrophysicist at the ANU Mount Stromo Observatory, and, and Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics. Professor Schmidt received his undergraduate degree from the University of Arizona and his master's degree and PhD from Harvard University. Um, Professor Schmidt, please welcome you to the stage for your presentation. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you all. Um, it is a great pleasure. This is my first trip to Chennai. I've been to India many, many times over the last uh, 15 years uh, and have worked uh, on a large number of astronomy projects with my um, Indian uh, colleagues. Uh, India, of course, has a, a remarkable history of astronomy, and one of the things I'll be talking uh, to you today about is uh, what is Chandrasekhar's greatest work, that of um, the fact that white dwarfs become unstable uh, at what we call the Chandrasekhar mass. Uh, and of course he ended up for that and other things winning the Nobel Prize himself um, a long time ago now. Today I want to talk to you about the state of the universe. Uh, before I do, you've seen our uh, propaganda uh, from uh, the university. Uh, and the reason I'm here is that we can see in Australia that India is emerging as, a, as an academic uh, you know, superpower coming up. Doesn't feel like it probably quite yet to you here, but uh, there are amazing things happening here. And we wanna make sure that we have the opportunity uh, to get in and start working with you on these areas of mutual interest, whether it be um, here in physics and engineering or more broadly in even the social sciences and humanities. Uh, ANU has a special role in Australia to provide comprehensive insights in the entire region. And so, for example, on my staff, I have one of the world's greatest Sanskrit scholars who teaches more students in India than he does in Australia. Uh, and that's just part of the way that we make sure that we understand the region. And of course, the best way is to make sure that we exchange and have people coming and working with each other, and that's how we can really, I think, uh, make sure that we can collectively solve the problems going forward. So today we're going to talk about the state of the universe, and this is just a way of going through what we know about the universe. And it's sort of a tour of the history because, of course, we have quite an intriguing story about the universe we lived in, we live in, uh, and it's one that I wouldn't say completely makes sense yet. We're making sense of it but it's really based on literally a hundred years worth of work, as you will see. So the state of the universe that we find ourselves in 2017 is that we live in a universe that's expanding, a universe that's 13.8 billion years old. And I should say it's not 13.9 and it's not 13.7, it's 13.8. And the universe is very nearly geometrically flat, that is without global curvature, and I'm gonna talk to you about what these concepts mean, knowing that not everyone in the room is a physicist. But the universe is also a bit of a mess. And that's because it's not as simple as you might think it should be. It's made up of a whole bunch of stuff, roughly in equal proportions. It's 70% dark energy, the stuff that I helped discover and win the Nobel Prize for. It's 25% stuff we call dark matter stuff that we can see the gravitational effect of, but we can't actually identify as any piece of 
material within our particle physics understanding of the universe. It's about one part in a thousand neutrinos. And it's about one part in uh, 20,000 photons. So it's got these mixture of at least five things, all within a factor of 10,000 or so of each other in relative abundance. But if we were to go back at any point in time, that ratio would change a lot. And if we go back, you know, forward into the future, then the, there, there will be only one thing, as near as we can tell, which is dark energy, and everything else will be minuscule and of no importance whatsoever. So it's a funny, funny universe in terms of how it's been constructed. And I should say, in the part that we understand, which is that tiny little wedge, wedge of 5%, we look at the atoms, which we can actually see and measure, um, that's roughly 74% hydrogen, 24% helium, and 2% lithium beyond. And uh, those atoms, const the constituents of those atoms are things we do understand reasonably well. And the reason we do understand those things well is it's so easy to measure uh, atoms in the universe. They are the things that we are made out of and we have very sensitive detectors to go through and understand that sector. Neutrinos are relatively complicated. We have a somewhat of a knowledge of them. I won't talk too much about them today. I'll talk a little bit. And photons, it turns out, we're very good at measuring as well in the cosmic microwave background, which we'll, I'll describe later on. We have an exquisite understanding of them. All right, so let's go to some history. Now, if we go to um, the 1917, we come to a time when astronomers first started looking at things beyond our own galaxy, or our own galaxy, to other galaxies. Now, they didn't know there were other galaxies. They were called nebulae. And by taking a spectrum, they were able, and this is Vesto Melvin Slifer, who worked up in northern Arizona, and his job, principal job, was to be mapping the canals of Mars. But as a side project, he measured the spectra of galaxies, and he is, of course, remembered much better for his spectra of galaxies, because he discovered in 1917 that all of the galaxies were redshifted. That is, their spectra looked like that of a star, but it was stretched, stretched redward of what it should have been. And thanks to understanding the Doppler shift, uh, he was able to go through and deduce that these galaxies were all moving away from us at hundreds, if not thousands, of kilometers per second. Because, of course, light is just another form of wave and is subjected to the Doppler shift if you're moving a, fr moving a fraction of the speed of light. So, in 1916, Slifer measured that galaxies all seem to be moving away from us. And this was a bit of a conundrum in 1916, 1917, because at the time, the Copernicus, uh, you know, the, the, the Copernican principle that we should be a place like all other places in the universe was well established. And yet, we seem to have an observation that indicated we were a special place, a special place that everything was moving away from. And so this was not understood. And it remained a non, not well understood until more observations came along, along with the theory. And so the observations came from measuring the distances to those galaxies. And of course, we can measure distances in astronomy by looking at things. We can't just stick a ruler out to the nearest object. We have to judge how things appear. And things, of course, look um, fainter the further away they are. They also look smaller. Well, that's not true, it turns out. If space is curved and changing size, things get a funny shape. They can actually look bigger if you go far enough away, because the universe, if it's expanding, will be smaller. And in the whole universe, acts as a giant magnifying glass. We'll come back a little bit more to that later. But we're going to come back to the idea that the further away something is, the fainter it appears. So in 1929, Edwin Hubble went out and he used the brightest stars to measure the distances to the nearest galaxies. And to do that, I, he had to I think assume it's always that important the best thing to look you can do at the time that underpins our greatest discoveries. It's nothing special up there, right? It's kind of a messy diagram that you would be embarrassed to turn into your high school professor. But it does show that there is a trend. Objects that have low recession rates 
have brighter stars than those with uh, fast recession, right? And there's a clear increase as you move from left to right in that diagram. It is on the basis of that diagram that it was proclaimed that the universe is expanding. So great things start with messy diagrams. I'm going to show you my own messy diagram that won me the Nobel Prize later on. Okay, so let's just think about this. This is it's actually quite intuitive if you think about it. Imagine I have a universe. Here's my universe, and I'm going to expand it. So let's expand the universe. I've expanded the universe. And now let's overlay before I expand it with after I expanded it. What do we see? Well, we see that nearby objects have moved a little bit when I've expanded the universe, and the distant objects have moved a lot. Indeed, if you have an expanding universe, everyone in the universe sees the same thing. The further the distance, the faster the motion. So that's sort of just something that happens in an expanding universe, what, what Hubble saw. And of course, it solved the conundrum of 1916 of Slightford. Everyone in the universe sees the same thing. The universe is expanding relative to you, things are moving away. On the other side of the universe, relative to them, things are moving away. So it doesn't mean that the Copernican principle is broken. In 1915 and then in 1916, the first versions of Einstein's theory of general relativity were coming to bear. And these things were disconnected initially, but they became connected after 1929 quite deeply. So in 1907, Einstein had what was, he described, his most wonderful thought. And it occurred when he saw someone fall off the roof of uh, a building. And as he watched this person fall off the roof of the building, rather than calling an ambulance or saying, oh my, he said, wow, I think that person must feel weightlessness. <laughs> and I think that must always be true, that the motion of acceleration and gravity itself must always be equivalent. They must always be exactly the same. Now, a small thought, but it took him seven and a half years of lots of math, it turns out, to reconcile for that to always be true. And the only way he could reconcile it was if um, space was curved. And his equations of general relativity came from that, um, that work over seven and a half years. So this, it turns out, is what made Einstein famous as a public figure. Not e equals mc squared, made him famous within physics circles, but in 19, um, 1919, 1920, when this had to be talked about, it is this discovery that confirmed the notion of curved space uh, that made Einstein uh, famous. And so here we are in the front page of the London Times, talking about only 12 people in the world understand what's going on, um, that Einstein had a thought, and he figured out in his head what was going on in nature, such that 100 years later, we've never found this to be in error in any way, shape, or form. Now, that does not happen very often. It is a very rare time where, by aesthetics alone, we're able to create a new way of thinking. So you can think of Copernicus kind of did it. Um, Einstein did it. Everyone else has always had a reason, something they're trying to fix. This is a unique time in history, and we're often told this is the way science works. Science never works this way. It's only worked this way a couple times in history, and that's why it is such a profound moment that we as physicists revere. And of course, the reason it was interesting is it was a thought but it was a thought that was vindicated by observation. So this is the real observation made uh, by Eddington uh, and company in an eclipse. So what they did is they went and took a picture. They didn't manage to get their telescope focused, but uh, c'est la vie, I've been there and done that. Uh, and here during an eclipse that was behind uh, a, a stellar field, they then waited till the sun was gone, took another picture, and they could see how the stars were displaced. And the displacement of the stars was consistent with the curvature of space 
as described by general relativity and not consistent with that described by a hack-up job of Newton's laws. You can make Newton's laws cause um, you know, light to be bent, but you sort of have to cheat a little bit to make it. And so the prediction of curved space, of course, is quite profound. It also makes the, the theory particularly complicated if you've ever had to study it. Uh, and that allows you, it also allows you to do what Einstein, allowed Einstein to do what Newton never could, which is to solve essentially the equations of cosmology. What does gravity do in a universe that goes on without end? Now it turns out you can't solve that with Newton's laws, and you can convince yourself by using Gauss's law, and you realize if you apply Gauss's law to a universe that's got anything in it, you will find that the only solution is that the universe has nothing in it. An empty universe is the only solution to Gauss's law um, if you use Newtonian gravity. But Einstein, it turns out you could do it. And when he did it, of course, Einstein got an answer which he didn't like, which was that the universe would be in motion, it would be dynamic. And he didn't know what that meant. He just knew that you know, the scale of the universe should be changing. And Einstein, like all theorists that we all know and love, did what all theorists always do. He looked around and said, I have this beautiful set of equations that doesn't quite seem to fit observations. So he added a budge factor. And that budge factor he called the cosmological constant. And that, in his idea, would be something he could trivially add to his equations. It didn't need to be there, but it didn't really break them in any way. But the cosmological constant, which we think of now as energy that fills all of space, fills the vacuum, well, that energy, when you throw it into his equations, uh, causes gravity to be repulsive. It has negative pressure. And so by having exactly the right amount to counteract the density of other stuff in the universe, you could balance gravity out and make it essentially zero. Now it turns out the universe with this stuff in it was unstable. So any perturbation in the universe would set the whole thing into motion. So in the end, it was not a fix. And indeed, Einstein was quoted as saying that he was acting like a donkey, adding the cosmological constant into his equations later on in life. So Einstein's theory of general relativity kind of changes our perception of what the expanding universe is. Because within the framework of general relativity, when you look at something far away and its light travels to you, it is redshifted not because the object is moving away from you, but rather because space between you and it is being created. So that's a little different. It's subtly different because it means, for example, that it is possible as space gets created to get disconnected from two objects if space is expanding fast enough, something that is not allowed, of course, in a special relativistic uh, scenario. So light is stretched as the universe expands, uh, and so it's philosophically a slightly different solution. I should say that if the universe weren't, uh, weren't accelerating, you probably don't need to make that distinction. They're essentially identical in any way, shape, or form that you want. You can take the special relativistic and the general relativistic um, case to think about it being motion rather than space stretching. But as soon as you add something like acceleration, then it's very difficult to make the special relativistic case work in the same way as the general relativistic case. All right, so we have an expanding universe. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's think. If the universe is expanding, we can run it in reverse and say, well, what must have happened in the past? If the universe is expanding, that means in the past, things were closer together. I go a bit further in the past, things are even closer together. There is a time in a expanding universe where everything in the universe is on top of everything else. So the notion of something like a Big Bang is sort of uh, just in the middle of what you would expect if the universe was expanding. The only way you would not have something like that would be to be creating material out of the ether uh, like was uh, done in the 1960s um, in sort of the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the universes that were sort of eternal. So uh, if we think of this as a graph, um, the expansion rate of the universe, which is the slope of this line, we call that the Hubble constant, uh, essentially just drives you back to when the time of the Big Bang was. 
And so if you can measure how fast the universe was expanding, then you could reverse it, and essentially the reciprocal of that slope gives you the Hubble constant. Now I thought that was a pretty cool thing to think about when I went off to graduate school in 1989, and so I decided to use type two supernovae, uh, exploding stars, to go out and calculate how bright they were and to measure the distance to nearby galaxies and measure essentially the slope of that line. And here I am, three years, 11 months, and four days after I started, I was not counting. Well, okay, maybe I was. Um, with my PhD supervisor, Bob Kirshner, showing what the value of the Hubble constant was that I measured. Now, of course, this was also, uh, and I was not the only one working on this, this was the key project of the Hubble Space Telescope, and that was led uh, by Jeremy Mould, among other people, who was eventually the person at Mount Stromlo who brought me to uh, Australia. And so the value of the Hubble constant says the age of the universe, and the value I got turned out to be 73. The value that Jeremy Mould got with the Hubble Key Project was 72. So he said I could stay on the path because <laughs> my thesis was at least not too terribly wrong. So if you measure the rate of expansion of the universe, you get an age of the universe of roughly 14 billion years old. But of course, this diagram is too simple because that line is straight. We know the universe should be full of gravity, and so, for example, if the universe has a reasonable density, um, it will uh, slow down over time and will be quite a bit younger if it's sufficiently dense than indicated by a straight extrapolation of that line. So the slowing down of gravity is something you need to account for. And it's important, of course, because it tells you what's going on in the future. If I have a universe that's just coasting along, that is, it has essentially zero density or very low density, the universe just keeps getting bigger and bigger. It goes on forever, that line is straight. The universe is infinite into the future. If it's sufficiently dense, then at some point it will be dense enough such that its expansion will forever. Uh, so this struck me, well, I, this, this struck me as like the most amazing experiment I could ever do. And in 1994, fate handed me on a plate the opportunity to do that experiment. And from your perspective, I had just finished my thesis. I had about five papers on the physics of supernovae that I wanted to get out. And fate handed me the opportunity to do this experiment and it was crazy, but I dropped everything I was doing. I never published several of those papers. I got a couple of them out eventually. And I said, I need to do this because this is the most important thing I can do. So I took a big risk. Uh, and I think one of the things that we don't do these days enough is to take risks. Science is supposed to about, be about taking risks. And it's important for us to do risk. And of course, I didn't know quite what I was going to discover, but I just knew it was the thing I should be working on. So what, what happened in 1994? Well, one of the things in 1994 is we began to understand type 1a supernovae. <coughs> so what's a type 1a supernova? Well, I've, I've highlighted it's something related to Chandrasekhar. So if we go to the Sun-Earth system. The Sun-Earth system lasts for about 10 billion years. And in roughly, as the, as the Sun gets older, its nuclear um, fusion generator uh, gets more and more efficient effect effectively, and it will cause the sun to pop up slowly over time, and when it gets into burning helium in its core, it pops up a lot, destroys the Earth. Eventually, it completely consumes all the nuclear energy it can, and the core collapses into what we call a white dwarf star, a star where electron degeneracy <coughs> takes over. It's a star roughly the size of the Earth, but the density, well, density probably 10 to the nine of water. So it's very, very dense ball of gas. Now, and that ember in the center of our sun sort of fades away into oblivion and never to be seen or heard of again. If instead the sun was born with a sibling, it's a much more interesting um, things that can happen. So one scenario is that as the first star starts to puff up, it dumps a whole bunch of its outer bits onto the first, the, the lighter of the two stars. 
And that star then is hot and starts to act as a much bigger star over time. And the first star collapses down to a white dwarf just like the sun would. It tends to produce a very pretty planetary nebula in the process. But then when we go back and look at the evolution of the system, the now more massive star will burn quickly through its material. It'll start to puff up and it can start donating material to the white dwarf and making it heavier and heavier and heavier until it reaches, reaches this magic mass of 1.383 times the mass of our sun, which is the Chandrasekhar mass, where uh, gravity overcomes electron degeneracy pressure and the whole thing starts to try to collapse into a black hole, but it doesn't get there because it ignites the carbon and oxygen in the white dwarf and the whole thing blows up as a giant thermonuclear detonation. A huge thermonuclear detonation that ends up making around six tenths of a solar mass, or that's about 100,000 Earths of, of iron and nickel. So uh, when uh, Australia exports a lot of iron and nickel to India, and you can thank these supernovae, and I try to get our rich uh, 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 magnates in Western Australia to invest heavily in understanding these, but I've gotten nowhere yet. So if you know anyone, let me know. I should say this is not the only way for this to occur. It may well be that uh, the first star doesn't dump enough material onto the white dwarf, so you get two big white dwarfs, which then over time can rotate and get closer together and merge and form a supernova. There are probably many different combinations and paths by which these explosions can occur. But they do occur, and they occur about once every oh, 250 years in a galaxy like the Milky Way. And when they do, something rises to be about five billion times brighter than our sun, fading away into oblivion. And the reason they're so bright is all of that nickel and iron they create is highly radioactive. And it, as it radioactively decays, the gamma rays go out, heat up all the material, and you get this huge pulse of energy um, that takes roughly 20 days to leak out of the star. Um, and that is what powers these things. So it's an amazing uh, event. 1994, a group in Chile, these are people I worked with my, on my PhD, went out and uh, they figured out how to use these to measure distances very accurately. And what they discovered, this team in Chile, was that how fast a supernova fades is related to how bright it is, how much radioactive material it produces. And they were able, using this technique, to calibrate things such that we could measure distances to 6% accuracy. Now, 6% accuracy doesn't sound particularly good if you're a precision physicist, but by astronomy standards, that is just outrageously good, especially when these are one of the brightest things in the universe, and we can see them halfway across the universe, it turns out with the next thing that happened in 1994, the Keck telescopes. Even with how bright these objects are, they're not bright enough to be seen all halfway across the universe unless you have a 10 meter telescope with any reliability. If you want to get a spectrum of a supernova, you need a 10 meter telescope. Those came online in 1994. So that was happening. And finally, the third piece of technology were CCDs, large format CCDs. Something that has led to uh, you know, the digital camera revolution. Of course, we use CMOS devices. Remembering, if anyone ever says, well, what's physics done for you lately? CMOS devices were developed for putting, essentially as a cheap alternative to CCDs, to send on probes going to Jupiter. So all of these things that we use in, in days you know, come out of weird places often in useless things like astronomy, which is, of course, less useless than people think. But in 1994, we got our first four megapixel versions of CCDs. We were able to make a large mosaic, and so we finally had the ability to look at enough sky at one time with a digital device having used photographic plates before, which were 100 times less sensitive, and that also happened in 1994. So those things came together all at once, and I dropped everything. I was down in Chile with my uh, colleague and mentor, Nick Sunset, and we formed a team to go out and measure uh, these supernovae back in time to figure out the ultimate fate of the universe by measuring its past. Now, we weren't the only ones doing this. A group in Berkeley uh, had been 
working on a similar project for since 1988, but they, without the benefit of these three critical things that happened in 1994. So this ended up being a very quick race. Uh, so the team that I led had done a lot of the work on supernovae, and the team that Saul Perlmutter led had done a lot of the technological development on, for example, the algorithms to find objects in large bits of data. Finding the objects in large bits of data is hard. So I'm taking you to 1994. This is an image, so that's 2,000 by 4,000 pixels, so eight megapixels. We take about 1,000 of those in a night, so that's about 50 gigabytes worth of data. It's 1994, we have Pentium 200s. <laughs> Who here remembers a Pentium 200? Not many of you. We had one gigabyte hard drives. I did not have a supercomputing physique. Uh, I had a budget of $8,000 as a postdoc. And so I daisy chained 50 computers across the mountain with Perl scripts and God only knows what else to process this data. And we had to do it fast because we had to turn around our discoveries within 24 hours. So it was complete craziness. And what you had to do was to find the needle in the haystack. So here is the supernova that we found, and we did that by comparing before and after. We go through and we look at something, for example, here on the 4th of April, that 24 days later had appeared. That supernova, <coughs> five billion light years in distance. It exploded before the Earth was formed. And that is the beauty of astronomy, that we can look back so far in time. So to give you a sense of what this is like, let me take you to uh, Chile at the four meter telescope. Here we are at the four meter telescope. It's got this big digital camera and unique in the world. That's Greg Aldering, silhouetted in black. He's from the other team, he's the bad guy. <laughs> but he has to use his telescope too because it's really the best telescope and the only one that really works in the world. Uh, as the sun sets, we have the sky go by, we sip our Chardonnay as the uh, telescope bits come down but we only have six nights a year. And that's, we have the biggest program on this telescope of any team, us and Saul program. So six nights a year, nothing can go wrong. I have my computer program going in using old world uh, AI to try to find these needles in the haystack, but we use new world AI, which is about 15 people who went through and said, yeah, that one looks okay. We get together and then we have to send them over to Hawaii to the Keck telescopes within 24 hours so that we can identify their, their redshift and their spectral type to make sure that they really are type 1a supernovae and not something else that confused us. And here's Adam Reese and Alex Filipinko there and they're sitting in the other control room because Keck's two telescope is Saul Perlmutter. Why? Because he needs to use that telescope too. Uh, so it was an interesting competition where we occasionally got to go out and see each other, but it was also very, very competitive. Uh, but the competition, I think, was good because it mean we had, meant we had to work harder and faster and at the same time be incredibly careful because we know the other team is going to show and tell us if we get something wrong. And we also know that they're going to wipe us out if we're going too slow, too, too conservative. So in 1997, at the end of 97, Adam Reese, who was leading our measurement, sent me a figure that more or less looked like this. Each supernova provides a measurement of expansion on this diagram. And I have the one sigma error bars here. And you can see in the nearby universe, you can't really differentiate the models because the uncertainty is too large. But when we go to the distant ones, you can immediately see that not a single object is down in this part of the diagram. And so you can more or less rule out that line or any line like that. And that line was ruled out by this data at a roughly five sigma. So think 99.99999. Uh, then you say, hmm, well, they are a bit above that line. And this is where you really need to go in and understand your uncertainties and things. And you can say, well, what is the, off what is the chances that this data set is down in the yellow part of the diagram? And the answer was about 3.3 sigma against, 99.8 type of stuff. So that was pretty strong evidence, but not, I would say, proof that the universe was accelerating. Except for Saul Perlmutter's team arrived independently, unbeknownst to us, with exactly the same answer. 
and an independent data set. And so when you put the two together, you didn't quite reach the magic five sigma, but you reached about four and a half. So together in 1998, we had fairly strong evidence that the universe was accelerating. Would I say it was a definitive discovery in 1998? No, I would not. Other people have described it as that. I would say it wasn't. It was strong evidence for it. But that is what we won the Nobel Prize for. And here is the team in Stockholm in 2011. Uh, and here is Saul Perlmutter's team in 2011. It's worthwhile, uh, I think, looking at our team especially, because uh, there's one thing that I don't like about this picture, is there's not a single woman in it. Uh, that is a reflection of what astronomy was in 1994, especially in my field. Half the graduate students I've trained have been women in supernova physics. That is more than had ever been trained, literally, in the history of the field. So things have changed. Astronomy is much more uh, a, a female-friendly field, but it wasn't very female-friendly back uh, when this experiment was done. All right. Hopefully, we'll get on. So what's pushing on the universe? Well, the easiest solution comes, and the first one that we knew about, of course, was Albert Einstein's cosmological constant, AKA dark energy. We want to make it something a little more flexible. If you go through and do a detailed analysis on those papers, you'll see that we needed to explain our measurements for the universe to be about 30% normal, normal gravitation, gravitating matter and about 70% material that has negative pressure or pushes on the universe. So people wanted to go out and test this. And one of the first experiments was done in Australia with the Anglo-Australian um, Redshift Survey, where they went out and measured 221,000 galaxies. And you see this foam structure. And that foam structure you can understand by going through and essentially doing what we call in-body simulations, where you take um, essentially a, a set of perturbations in an early universe, and you allow gravity to, to, to grow the lumps and bumps in the universe. And here is a real set of simulation. And you can see that you get these very complex structures which end up looking an awful like, lot like what we see in the universe. <coughs> so in 2001, um, the first of these uh, big experiments were able to be done from the data taken at the AAT. And you can go through and you can literally say, well, here's one model of gravity and stuff in the universe. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. And you can ask yourself, which is the real universe that we live in? Now, normally I'd have you vote. I'm not going to have you vote this time for lack of time. But most of you should realize that Model 3 is the one that looks like the observations in this case, the statistical properties of it are. And that model turned out to be 30%, um, essentially what we would say omega matter, or I was uh, essentially a, a, a mixture of normal gravitational matter that made up 30% of the universe. This experiment was essentially completely blind to dark energy, but it was able to measure very accurately the matter content of the universe. And so that 30% of the stuff needed to make the universe flat, precisely measured to within about 5%. But that was the age old problem that had been known since the time of Fritz Zwicky in the 1930s. That was six times more gravity than there were atoms. And so that brought up the idea of dark matter yet again. Every experiment we've ever done shows that whenever we measure gravity on large scales, there's always a lot more of it than there are atoms and things that we know to account for it. It doesn't matter if we look in galaxies. So for example, Ken Freeman at Mount Stromlo made the first measurement of a rotation curve and identified it as being uh, anomalous and indicated there must be something like dark matter. Of course, Vera Rubin went through and did that for a whole range of galaxies over time, as did Albert Bosma. Uh, if we look in, as Zwicky did in clusters, again, we see huge amounts of dark matter. And more modern, we get to see when you have two clusters collide, that in the center, the atoms form x-rays, that's the pink, and the dark matter, which you can measure by how the matter distorts, distorts space in the back, goes right through itself. And so here we see the two components of matter as we describe dark matter and atoms in real life as you would expect. That's not the only uh, experiments we have for dark matter. 
The really powerful one is actually the cosmic microwave background. So as I said, these are just simply sound waves splashing around the universe since the time of the Big Bang. The Big Bang, you subscribe to inflation, or even if you don't, had a set of uh, perturbations uh, in it, essentially a, uh, a scale-free set of perturbations. You let those things go through and splash about the universe using the correct equations. You can go through and look at what the splash marks look like compared to the theory. And so, if you think about it, if you have two ponds and you throw a rock in it, let's say that's water and that's honey, this, the wave action is going to be different in the two palms. And so you can literally go through and look at the wave action to see what's in the universe. And so the Big Bang uh, threw essentially the moral equivalent to gravel in the universe, that's the initial fluctuations. You get this 380,000 year set of splashes which are imprinted in the cosmic microwave background, which is a, essentially a picture of the universe when it was 380,000 years old. The splash marks are only one part in 100,000, but are exquisitely well measured. And so if we go through and we look at that, you can go through and you can use uh, essentially this technique of showing through what we call spherical harmonics, but this tells you how many waves there are of different frequencies. So these are great big waves of one degree, these are sort of half degrees, and you get a very distinct pattern a pattern of which the theory is the line. So that line is in a spline. That is the theory that you would have expected based on the work that we did in 1998. And it's been tuned up a little bit to, because it's much more accurate than what we had. But the theory is unchanged. That is, the theory of dark matter, dark energy, and atoms pre correctly predicted in advance to extraordinarily high accuracy, that set of curves. And it showed that the ratio of dark matter to atoms is about six and a half to one. And if you get rid of dark matter and change it to something else, you can't fit that curve. So when people come up and tell me, do you believe in dark matter? I say, I do. And it's not actually because of all the rotation curves and stuff. And what I want to see is if you believe in MOND, which is uh, modified Newtonian dynamics, fit that curve without imprinting it in the initial perturbation spectrum, which is the only way I've ever seen it done. All right. The other thing, of course, you can do is you've got sound waves, and the sound waves have a scale of the speed of sound times the age of the universe. And so you have a ruler, and you can use that ruler to go in and look, essentially, at one part of a triangle, and you can measure, effectively, the angles of a triangle using that uh, ruler is one side of your isosceles triangle. Uh, in other words, to think of it is when the space is curved onto itself, it acts as a magnifying glass, as a demagnifying glass, and not too much of a magnifying glass. And so, of course, uh, it's uh, relatively intuitively easy to understand. Uh, if you think of it this way, you can look at, this is a universe you expect if it's open, closed, or flat. And it is exactly flat the measurements here. So the universe is very nearly perfectly flat. It's within a half a percent. And so this measures any type of material in the universe. The gravity experiment measured material that has normal gravity. And so we can take these two experiments, one from galaxies, one from CMB. So here's the CMB measurement. And then we can subtract off the 30% total matter from gravity. And that leaves us with 70% mystery matter, stuff that we don't really understand why it would be there, but is completely consistent with the stuff that the supernova, uh, under, uh, the supernova project uh, have unveiled. That is, however we look at it, it looks like we have a universe that is roughly of this proportion. So um, I am going to skip ahead just a little bit. Um, for time and uh, say that uh, there are a couple things that we can do um, to better measure um, things like, oh, maybe I've lost that slide. Uh, well, coming, coming up, there are other things to do that are going to be very exciting. Um, and this comes from understanding how galaxies uh, form in the beginning of the universe. How did 
the universe emerge. And these are going to be the next generation of telescopes. And so ANU is part of the Giant Magellan Telescope, but that's just one of three telescopes that are coming online. Uh, there's also the 30 meter telescope, which India is involved in. Um, and finally, there's the European 40 meter telescope. Uh, these are going to accompany the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which uh, NASA should launch next year. So coming up, there's going to be incredible excitement because these new sets of instruments are going to allow us to look back to the first stars and the first galaxies in the universe and see how things emerge. But they're also going to allow us to look into the atmospheres of planets, of uh, nearby planets, and see do they have biosignatures. So I think astronomy has some really exciting future ahead of it over the next 10 to 20 years. But of course, the future of the universe has a fair bit of excitement to it as well. Uh, this is the uh, diagram I showed you earlier, but if the universe is full of dark energy, the universe runs away. The more the universe expands, the more it wants to expand. And so you get accelerated expansion such that the future of the universe is dark energy. The more space expands, the more dark energy is created relative to normal matter. That creates even a greater discrepancy in pushing versus pulling. And so you eventually get the creation of space happening faster than even light can travel. That is, if I look at a galaxy, its uh, light as it uh, tries to travel to us will literally get frozen out in the expansion of space. Things I see today will disappear tomorrow. So right now, it turns out that if I look at an object at, for example, a redshift of roughly two, that object uh, will uh, disappear. That is, um, the, the light that that object is emitting right now will never reach me. I only see it in the past. And so this means that as we think to future generations, and these are generations billions upon billions of years in the future, it's a rather sad time for cosmology. Because unless dark energy suddenly disappears, the universe is, uh, at an ever-increasing rate expands fades away, and leaves us astronomers with nothing left to measure. And that truly is sad, and a reason why you should fund your local astronomy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. I actually can't remember the Vice Chancellor of an Australian University, one, giving a presentation in India before, or two, with a, on a topic with such interest and passion. So, so thank you, um, Professor. Um, we, I, I know it's resonated with this audience because you probably don't know, but there's a room next door with a, a hundred plus people in there getting it live streamed, um, and it's also virtually being live streamed. So you've got a lot of people out there to listen to you today. Um, we've got a couple of minutes to take a couple of questions, and then we're going to go to afternoon tea outside, which everyone's invited to. But is, are there any questions now that you might want to raise? Yes, sir. Fascinating talk. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, last year, gravitational waves uh, have been detected. And what does that mean to uh, you know, some of the things that you were showing about uh, in terms of figuring out how fast the universe is expanding and also the proportion of dark energy? So, um, yeah, last year's uh, discovery of gravitational waves was truly one of the most amazing moments of my uh, scientific lifetime. We saw, for the first time, uh, black holes. We saw them merge together, but we effectively saw them, but not with light. We saw them with these gravity waves. And what was remarkable, as these things spiraled together and made this kind of chirp, where space, as it went through us, kind of stretched and strained at a one part in 10 to the 18, amazing we can make that measurement, we saw a signal that exactly was predicted in advance. And we learned that two black holes, roughly 30 solar masses each, uh, merged together. Now, I was quite excited about that because I think there are lots of hints that big stars, ones sort of 20 to 30 to 50 solar masses, which we know exist, they don't ever seem to turpin, turn into supernovae. And if they don't turn into supernovae, what do they turn into? Black holes. 
and then you don't see them because of course we always look for things that go boom not things that just disappear uh, we're beginning to look for things that disappear uh, because of this so this is an indication that maybe these things exist so for me that was just an exciting piece of physics in principle if you can go through and find these things the galaxies they occur in you can measure their distance and their redshift and make a measurement it's not clear that's going to be competitive um, partially because things have moved on so fast that it's they were it's a, it's a very accurate way to measure distance but it's not clear anymore that it adds value if you did hundreds of them you probably could do it that's that's a ways to go the big problem is when two black holes merge it's not clear they make anything that signals them out as being there except for the gravitational waves and even with LIGO India we're going to be able to narrow it to a patch on the sky that's relatively small but probably still contains tens of thousands of galaxies and so whether or not we'll be able to pinpoint which galaxy is is to be determined but it's amazing physics and from the type of stuff I do it's it's truly astounding what we're going to be able to learn in the future Sir, uh, uh, how old is the uh, universe and uh, uh, the changes affecting in the universe will affect the Earth and how much uh, would, be, would be affected and which country is the leader in uh, this kind of uh, studies? So, um, the changes um, that are happening in the universe are very, very slow. So they are on a scale of one part in 10 to the 18 per year, or per second, so 10 to the 18 per second. Uh, it turns out, though, that the acceleration uh, has to overcome local gravitational effects. So, for example, the Milky Way, and indeed the nearest galaxies around the Milky Way, are uh, essentially the, the gravity contained in these bodies overwhelms the dark energy. The, the density, I'll give you an example, the density of dark energy is 10 to the 30 times less than the density of the Earth. So dark energy is irrelevant in this part of the universe. It's only when you get into big enough spheres where the average density within that sphere is, um, you know, really contains lots of empty space where dark energy can work its magic. So from an Earth point of view, we're going to lose our galaxies, but we will not lose our stars. Indeed, the stars in the Milky Way, most of them, will be around uh, for trillions of years to come. <clears throat> our own sun's only going to be around for another probably five to six billion years, noting it will overheat from the Earth's perspective probably over the next billion or so. So we, we have some time to find another place to go, but not an infinite amount of time. And in terms of the countries that are leading this work, uh, it's really an international group. It, it involves people here in India. It involves people in Australia, the US, Europe. It is truly, I would say, a multinational um, uh, set of work that involves, I would say, at least 50, 50 countries. One more, one more question. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, instead of uh, this dark energy, let us assume uh, the boundary of uh, uh, several billion years, uh, light years of uh, this uh, uh, gravity core for our universe. It will attract the universe automatically, and the universe will always accelerate. And uh, it will uh, uh, gives a good answer for uh, velocity of light. And it, may, it will be a medium uh, between the uh, multi-universes. <coughs> so, um, I'm not sure if I quite understood the question, but uh, so the, the standard model that we use right now is based on a fairly limited number of um, assumptions. It does have some assumptions. Does it mean that it is the only solution? Um, no. It is quite possible that uh, the current model needs to be perturbed in some way. Uh, and that's the process of science. We go through, we have uh, 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 
a way of describing things which uh, uh, effectively matches all observations. And I'd say the only thing we have is a discrepancy <coughs> on the Hubble constant at about 5% right now between near and far. And we still need to find out if that's real. Uh, it may well be there are other ways to understand dark energy. But for those ideas to emerge, they need to predict in an uncomplicated way all aspects of the observations we make today. Uh, and the dark energy observations involve, uh, also you can see the effects of dark energy now in the cosmic microwave background pattern. Uh, you can see it in how galaxies actually form in detail. And these are all things that need to be tested. I am a, a, a real agnostic on the theory uh, that underpins thing. I just note that the theory we have now is done remarkably well, much better than I would have thought it to do. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's right. And so we need to keep uh, interrogating the current theory, make sure it's right. And that's uh, the reality is that as we get more information, if we break uh, the current model, that means we're going to have to change it somehow. And I don't know how that's going to happen, uh, but uh, it, it is the process of science. Sir, one more question, please. One more. Shall I ask? Yes, one more. Sir, the string theory says the universe is having 11 dimensions. What do you say about that, sir? What is the fate of string theory? Is it going to be accepted or not? All right, so uh, string theory is a way of putting together gravity and the other three forces of nature. It tends to have 10 or 11 dimensions. Uh, and that's sort of a natural mathematical construct of the model. So what string theory needs to do uh, to be more than just an idea, it needs to predict things. So the big problem with string theory is it does not yet predict well the universe we exist in. It, has, it can be tuned to explain some things about our universe. But at this point, it has not, I think, observationally allowed us to test it. So whether or not string theory can be uh, you know, developed such that it can be tested in ways where you can say, now there is a definitive thing that string theory uh, you know, predicted that I can test. When it does that, then I suddenly become interesting. It doesn't mean it's wrong, but that has to be the underpinning basis of any new theory is testability. String theory does not have that yet. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be working on it, but it does mean that is at the core of what string theory needs to do next. And some people believe that that's just around the color, you know, the, the corner, and other people, like Ed Witten, not so sure. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I do need to thank a couple of people before we finish. Uh, who we could not have done this presentation today without. Um, Dr. I. M. Perimal, the Executive Director of the Tamil Nadu Science and Technology Centre. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> You've got a wonderful planetarium. I look forward to seeing the new uh, Professor Baskar Ramamurthy, the Director of IIT. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Rajendra Mutha, the COO of the Research Park. Professor Christian Balasubramaniam, who is acting in charge of international affairs at IITF. So thank you very much. Sir. <laughs> thank you very much. It's been very much appreciated. Uh, let's break the afternoon tea and we'll have continue the conversation next door. Thank you.